night, and this is what he has put on my heart for this evening, and uh, when we've done jobs or we've done a, maybe a sp- specific sport or a, a task that you've been given, schoolwork, uh, we've been told many times to put your heart into it. And when somebody says put your heart into it, what they mean is do it with all of the best of your capabilities. Whatever that is, give your absolute best. Put your heart into it. Don't just put, don't do mindless work. Don't do just um, strong back, weak mind work, but put your all into it. Put your heart into whatever it is that uh, we, we apply that to. And as we come to the book of Ezra tonight, and I've been, in my personal time, been studying the, the end of the captivity uh, from Babylon when the people started to go back to Jerusalem. And that's where I'm at right now. And as I've studied through uh, Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah and those books toward the end of the, the captivity when people began to come back to Jerusalem uh, from Babylon and Persia, it, it blows my mind at how God has orchestrated everything. And just as you, if you've never gone through the book chronologically, I, I highly encourage you to do so. It kind of puts all the puzzle pieces together and helps you to see the big picture. But as you come through the captivity and people begin coming back to Jerusalem, you get to start to see uh, the redemptive process, how that God promised it would be 70 years in captivity and then he would bring people back. And they came back in three waves and, and uh, God brought them back for different reasons and purposes and Zerubbabel was one man who led a group of, of Israelites back to begin the work on the temple. And uh, they got started, but then they got discouraged. And then God sent Ezra back to complete the work on the temple. And Ezra, of course, was there when Nehemiah came back with his group to build the wall uh, back around Jerusalem. That's all after the captivity. That's all at the beginning of the time frame Uh, where God's prophets would stop prophesying. Uh, Most people believe Joel was the second to last prophet, and then Malachi, and then the 400 years of silence. And so that all happened kind of at the same time, and then 400 years of not a fresh word from God. And so as the Israelites are coming back to Jerusalem, and they're beginning to rebuild not only the physical structures, but their testimony and the testimony of the Lord, Uh, Tonight I want to look at a certain passage here where Ezra has been given the the go-ahead by King Artaxerxes to come back from Persia uh, to Jerusalem to uh, complete the work of the temple. And so we're going to read chapter 7 tonight and then we'll go through it and see uh, the word for tonight about putting our heart into our service. So Ezra chapter 7 beginning in verse 1. Now after these things in the reign of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Marioth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzai, the son of Bukai, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylon. And he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his request according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel and of the priests and the Levites and the singers and the porters and the Nethanims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Now this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and at such a time. I make a decree 
that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. For as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of thy God, which is in thine hand. And to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. And all the silver and gold that thou canst find in all the province of Babylon, with the freewill offering of the people and of the priests, offering willingly for the house of their God which is in Jerusalem, that thou mayest buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs with their meat offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. And whatsoever shall seem good to thee and to thy brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold, that do after the will of your God. The vessels also that are given thee for the service of the house of thy God, those deliver thou before the God of Jerusalem. And whatsoever more shall be needful for the house of thy God, which thou shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house." And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree to all the treasurers which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it be done speedily. Unto an hundred talents of silver, and to an hundred measures of wheat, unto an hundred baths of wine, and to an hundred baths of oil, and salt without prescribing how much. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Also we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, nethanims, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, Set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. And whatsoever will not do, uh, and whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, and hath extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this evening, for the music, how it's uh, ministered to us, Lord, and as we've thought, on and about the Lord Jesus and his coming to this earth. Lord, we indeed are grateful for our Savior dying on the cross for our sins, rising from the dead so that we can have forgiveness of sins and life eternal. And now, Lord, as we come to your word and we look at this particular passage, I ask that you would help us to have understanding, Lord, that we would be able to give the sense and that we would um, grasp what is being said here. But, Lord, that we wouldn't just know it, but that we would put it into action in our lives. And then that we would commit, Lord, as Ezra did, to also teaching it and passing it on to uh, the next generation as well. Lord, I pray that whatever we've been given to do for your glory, that we would do it with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. So we've seen just this one chapter of Ezra where the people of God are going back to Jerusalem and God has blessed um, Artaxerxes with a mind, with a willingness to not only let God's people go back, but to provide what they'll need uh, for them to go back with writings, passports, if you will, um, from the king to make it safely to Jerusalem by the king's decree to do uh, the building of the temple there. And we see how he gave many instructions on uh, that they should be allowed with whatever they have, whatever money that they have, the silver and gold, that they should be allowed to use that to uh, build up this temple, to build up the house of God so that it wouldn't be a reproach. And he also gave them authority 
He gave Ezra authority to set up judges and magistrates there so that any who would rebel against the king's decree here uh, would face some kind of discipline or punishment. He was very serious about letting God's people go back to uh, Israel and accomplish this work. And And this is where we see the grace of God because Uh, God's people went into captivity for their sins, for their idolatry, for marrying people, uh, heathen people, and adopting their uh, sinful ways. And so they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians, a very wicked and mean people uh, who did horribly uh, to the children of Israel as they took them into captivity. But even as God had said and prophesied, um, the Babylonian Empire was taken over by the Persian Empire. We see that in the days of Daniel. If you read the book of Daniel, you'll see the transfer from Nebuchadnezzar to Darius to Cyrus. And those are the leaders of the Persian Empire as they took over Babylon. Now, the, the Persians were a little bit uh, friendlier to God's people. And then God put it on their hearts to little by little let his people come back and reestablish Jerusalem Uh, the place where God had placed his name. And so he has sent Ezra back with the ability to do whatever he sees fit in the building of the temple. And there's a couple things we see of Ezra here that I think we can apply to our own lives. And uh, first of all, as found in verse 6, the first five verses tell us um, the time frame and then Ezra's lineage, how he goes all the way back to Aaron. So he is a proper priest. And then it tells us in verse 6, this Ezra went up from Babylon And he was a ready scribe, a knowledgeable scribe. Um, He was a a skilled scribe. He was one who could interpret uh, the law of God. He could read it and understand it and teach it very well. And so this man Ezra was a a, one of the top priests and obviously an educated man and a well-spoken man the kind of guy you would want to lead your group and so God tells us a little bit here about Ezra he went up from Babylon he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses which the Lord God of Israel had given and the king granted unto him all his request and here's the phrase according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him In verse 9, we see that same phrase. It says, For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the month came he to Jerusalem. How? According to the good hand of his God upon him. First thing we see here is that Ezra had the hand of God upon him. And, you know, I I think as I pray about um, the Lord's blessings here on Central Baptist and the people of Central Baptist, we need to be careful that, yes, we want God's hand to be in the work, and to bless the ministry. But you know, if he's blessing the minister, the work will be blessed. And we see here that he his hand was upon Ezra. We read in, of, of Joseph that God was with him and made all that he did to prosper wherever he was. Whether it was in uh, Potiphar's house or Pharaoh's house or in the prison, whatever he did prospered. Uh, it is said of Nehemiah that God was with him and his hand was upon him. It says the same of Daniel and many others in the word of God, that God was with them and his hand was upon him. And we see here that God's hand, the hand of the good God, was upon Ezra. And you understand that in our own power, we'll get burned out. Um, Things can be exciting for a while. Uh, We can do things for a while in our own strength and our own excitement and in in the anticipation of what may or may not happen. We can do things for a while. But you know, if God's hand is on it and our heart is in it, God will bless that. And that's what we need to strive for, is not necessarily uh, trying to keep ourselves revved up and pumped up and excited, but walking with God and praying to God for his hand to be upon us as we minister. And and it's, it's, it's one of those things that is vitally important for God to move in a ministry. And um, I, I've been thinking about our, our ministries here at, at Central and thinking about all of the different people and all of the different ways that ministry goes on here. And if we think, first of all, about the academy here, there's several folks in our church who uh, minister down there year-round in the academy. They give of their time. And their effort. And they make great sacrifice to serve the Lord there in the academy. And we see children and young people saved every year. And we see the fruit of that as they grow up and they come back and say, Thank you uh, for what you did for us. And it's a real blessing to know that. And it happens because God has his hand on the ministry, yes, but God has his hand on people too. And God has blessed this because there are people who have given their time and their effort and their energy and made personal sacrifice uh, for such a ministry to take place. 
And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the academy and the ministry that does take place there and the souls that are saved. Um, I think about our, our children's ministries that goes along with the academy. It's starting in the nursery, right? Um, that might be one of the most vital ministries in the church. Uh, we know how, it, how distracting it would be for one child to cry out during the service. Imagine if they were all uptight, right? I mean, one needed changing, one needed to eat, one, uh, like many children, they're just mad. <laughs> I just want to cry. Uh, maybe they're not feeling well. Could you imagine what the auditorium would be like if the babies were all in here just were trying to take care of all that? Thank the Lord for the nursery. Thank the Lord for the nursery volunteers. Uh, the women who say, you know what, I'm going to give up a service every month to sit with the children and care for them and make sure that they're taken care of so that the majority of the other folks can either serve somewhere or be ministered to. And so I thank the Lord for the nursery and the people who head that up and the people who clean that up and the, and the folks who work in there from week to week and a, a very vital ministry. Isn't it a good problem to have a nursery? You know, there's a lot of churches that wish they needed one. There's a lot of churches that wish they needed nursery workers because they don't have any families or children or young people. And we have a great blessing here. And you think about not just the nursery, but our Sunday school. Um, from the children all the way up to our senior adults. And I thank God for our Sunday school teachers who prepare and they take time. And their ministry is to study the Word and then to come on Sunday morning and to share, to give what God has given them. And I pray for them every week that God would uh, fill them with His Spirit so that as they stand to teach, it's not just their words, it's not just what they've studied, but God is speaking through them and working through them to help us to learn His Word. Sunday school hour is a vitally important hour. I want to tell you this. I'm, I'm kind of a, a proud pastor, if you will, in a good way. Um, I have conversations with pastors all over this area and even a few around the country about trends in, in American church attendance. And many of the folks I've talked with are all talking about how their Sunday night and their Wednesday night attendance just has dwindled to the place where they've either stopped those services or they're thinking about stopping those services. And I say, I got to tell you, we've experienced the exact opposite of Central. Um, what we've seen in the past two years is our Sunday school and Sunday night and even Wednesday night attendance is on the rise. And that's unusual in the culture that we're in today. And uh, I'm thankful that people value God's word to the place that they say it's worth attending three times a week to get God's word. And we praise the Lord for that. And we're, we're thankful for our Sunday school teachers who, who put together quality uh, material, lessons. They study, they teach, and I'm thankful for that. From our nursery, singing this little light of mine, all the way up to our senior adults getting into some of the deeper subjects of the word of God. Thankful for our Sunday school teachers, our children's church teachers. They study and they teach a lesson and they sing songs with the children and they're teaching them how to give in an offering and they're teaching them how to sit still in church so that when they do grow up and they do uh, get old enough to sit in the auditorium, they know what it means to sit still and listen to someone give the word of God two hours in a row. That's a big deal for all of us, especially for little people, you know, for two hours in a row to sit still and listen. But I thank God for our, our children's church teachers who give of their time and study the Word and, and put the Word on a level where our children can get it. And, and, and them building those, putting those bricks into the lives of our children is a, an incredible ministry. I was thinking about children and teens ministry this week and how that uh, it's really prime real estate. You see, because as old people, we can get into, uh, we get set in our ways. You know, we, we learn something, we study it, we've heard it for decades, and then it just kind of sticks there. And, and we, we kind of just have one track mind. And, but we're young people, they're absorbing everything they're hearing. And they're still moldable, and they're still shapeable. And when they can hear the truth of the Word of God, it's making, a, it's making an impact. It's molding their soft hearts into, hopefully, uh, followers of Christ. People who know His Word and are obedient to His Word. So those who serve in our children's ministry have an especially high privilege and responsibility to get the Word of God to them because we are molding their hearts and their minds with the Word of God. 
very awesome responsibility. And boy, am I thankful for those who give their time to do such things. I think about our Awana workers on Wednesday night. And they meet down in the academy there and, and they have a game or two for the kids. But then they sit down and they have a, a lesson. And then they take time to sit down with the children and in a one-on-one or a one-on-two scenario, help them learn, memorize, put into their mind and hopefully into their heart the Word of God. And uh, I know what that means. Uh, our children have gone through that program and how it's benefited them. I know how much it benefits children to learn the, and have, have an adult sit across from them and take the time to help them learn that, teach them how to get those phrases out, get those into their mind. What a blessing that is. I'm thankful for the people who are there to early to set up and who are there late to turn everything off and make sure things are put away and, and locked up and for the people who do set up the games for the children and prepare a lesson on Wednesdays and uh, to teach on Wednesdays. I'm thankful for that. We think about our ministries here. We think about our greeters, the people who are our first impression for those who come in who've never been here before. And how we welcome them and let them see, uh, give them a bulletin, let them see where to go, maybe even take them where to go. Someone who's there to say, come on in, here's where you can go. Come on in, let me show you how to get to where you need to go. Uh, Very important. You never get a second chance to make a first impression, they say, right? I read a stat one time, it says seven, uh, people make their first impression within 17 seconds of meeting you. Whew. Doesn't give you much time, does it? Doesn't give you much time for them to get an impression. And so to be out in front and to welcome people, very important uh, to give them a tone or a feeling of what uh, Central is all about. And it ought to be about uh, the love and the welcoming and the hospitality of Christ. And I'm thankful for our greeters and those folks who participate there. I, I think about Brother John and Brother Larry who take care of the technical stuff behind the scenes and, and who make sure that the mics are on and that the music's ready and that the video's recording so that our shut-ins uh, have an opportunity to see uh, the church services and they can feel like they're here and, and then it broadcasts over the, the public access there. People can tune in and see that and, and, and the gospel's going out uh, week after week uh, through that ministry. And if we didn't have these guys running these controls, it couldn't happen. Uh, I was listening this week to uh, a pastor from First Baptist Church of Dallas, and he was doing the parable on the sower. I didn't know this. He said that uh, the, the, bro- the sowing where they throw this, the seed is called broadcasting. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, they take a handful of seed and they cast it, and it's a broadcast. Now, when we think of broadcast, we think of television or radio, and now we have podcasts and all these kind of things. But think about it. How broad and how wide does the gospel get to go through these ministries? Isn't that something? We'll never know until we get to heaven. Who heard something? Who heard the gospel through the television, through the DVD ministry? And we, you know, it's it's an important ministry. Thank God for the broadcasting of the gospel made possible by our video and our sound ministry. Thankful for that. I uh, I think about our music, our, our instrumentalists and and uh, the time and effort they put into learning the hymns for each week and, and refreshing themselves on that. And getting getting uh, the organ and the piano and the guitars and yeah, I wing it on the drums. And, and you know, we have, we have people who put their time into that. And then, then our choir who, who come at 3.30 or 4 o'clock every week and, and learn music so that we can have our hearts prepared for, before the preaching. And music is a vitally important part of a church service. And I, I know that some people treat it as a means to an end, but it is not that. It is ministry. And uh, it, is, it is vital to set the tone. It's vital to get people's minds and hearts thinking about the Lord. And I'm thankful for our choir and our choir members who give of their time and energy and effort to come and learn the songs, to minister to the people as they come in to church and uh, just be that, that first warm welcome as they hear the music of the Lord. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for everybody involved, our ensemble, our special singers, who take the time to prepare that, that vital part of the service. A lot of ministry goes on here. And it's easy to forget about some of it because it's out of sight and out of mind. Uh, I won't say much because they're incognito, but we have a safety team, you know. And uh, we can't talk all about what they do, but thank God we have people who are watching for us. We're, you know, we can have a level of comfort because we know that there are people who are trained and are, are available and, and are ready to respond should anything happen. And I'm thankful for the time that they give and the training that they've gone through and the 
sacrifices they make so that we can sit in here and feel safe uh, in the Lord's house. I'm thankful for that. I'm, I think about our trustees and uh, the, the, that they're stewards over the Lord's money and over his property here in his building and they do a good job keeping things in order and asking good questions and giving good feedback and working together and coming to conclusions and decisions that we believe prayerfully are the best for the church and I thank, I'm thankful for the experience of the men and the willingness uh, to serve in such a capacity. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Thankful for that. I'm thankful for our deacons uh, who work with me and are, are uh, you know, a group of counselors for me from time to time and encourage me and I know encourage many of us and I'm thankful for the service and the ministry that they have here at Central and for what that they do. A lot of ministry goes on. I think about things that we don't see even on Sundays like our sewing ministry, our peacemakers, the ladies who once a week come in and make uh, quilts for the children at Children's Hospital when they go to the Ronald McDonald House. And that, that personal touch of a gift that they do. And, and the many other things they do for the academy. And, and the Christmas stockings for Ronald McDonald House. And the time and the effort and the energy they give. Just to be a, um, a warm uh, touch from God's people. Uh, to folks who are having a rough time with their children. Thankful for that. So many things. So many ways that we can see that ministry happens here. Um, I think about those who uh, work with our young people. You know, Brother Chris and Miss Ashley, and they uh, give of their time on the weekends to take them on activities, and they give a week in the summer to take them to camp, and, and week after week they're teaching them and encouraging them. And recently, Brother Keith and Miss Karen have been working with them on Wednesday nights to, to teach them how to minister to folks through skits and puppets and things like that and sharing the gospel. I'm just thankful for those who give their time uh, for our teenagers who uh, take what they can and serve the Lord in that area. Because that's a, another a, age in life where you need somebody other than mom and dad uh, to be a godly influence and example. And so, th so thankful uh, for all. And I know many others, Tim and Jody have been on different trips. And I know Loretta and Don help out times. And I can't name everybody who has. But I know many others have helped minister to our teens. And very thankful uh, for that ministry that goes on here. A lot goes on. There's a lot that goes on. Some of it we never even see, but it's happening. I'm thankful for the ministries. I'm thankful for the people who serve here, for the people who give of their talents and gifts for the Lord. Ezra was a ready scribe, a skillful, knowledgeable scribe. And he gave what he had. He used what God gave him for his service. God's hand was upon Ezra. And then we find out in verse 10 something especially neat about him. It says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgment. Ezra did three things. He prepared three ways. He prepared his heart, number one, to seek the law of the Lord. He wanted to be knowledgeable about God's word. He wanted to know it. And we ought to want to know what God has said. But the only way we can do that is by studying it, reading it, and listening to the teaching and preaching of it. And it's not going to happen by osmosis. we got to study. Ezra prepared his heart to know the Word. I wonder tonight, have we prepared our hearts to know the Word? Well, how in the world do you prepare your heart? The Bible says Daniel purposed in his heart not to eat of the king's meat. It says that Ezra prepared his heart to know the word. How do you prepare your heart to know something? Very simple. You decide that you're going to put time and effort into it. You decide that with my heart, I'm going to make a concerted effort to know the word of God. It's not just going to be a, a, a thing on the side where if I'm driving to work, I might click on the radio and listen to a radio preacher for 15 minutes. It's, it's more than that. That's fine and that's good and that's helpful. But it's more than that. Knowing God's word says I have to prepare my heart to know it. Not just my mind, my heart. You know, do we pray before we study? You know, uh, just a simple prayer. Lord, I'm getting ready to look into your word. I ask that you would please give me understanding, that you would convict me where I need convicting, that you would encourage me where I need encouragement, and that you give me knowledge and understanding where I need it. 
Amen. You know, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will guide us in all truth. He stands ready to be a, a, an aid right next to us whenever we open the Word of God. How can I prepare my heart to know it? Ask God to help me with it. A sincere prayer asking God to help you to know His Word. I think about Daniel when he was reading and he came up across a part of the prophecy he couldn't understand. The Bible says he prayed for three weeks, prayed and fasted for three weeks about one passage he couldn't get. We know that God's answer was on the way and we remember that uh, the demons, the princes there of, of Persia fought against Gabriel and then Michael came along to help him out and Gabriel went three weeks to deliver the message. What does that teach me? Sometimes the answer's not gonna come just like that. Sometimes I'm gonna have to labor in the word to get understanding. And so to know it, we have to study it, prepare our hearts to know the word. Second thing he prepared his heart to do was to do the law of the Lord. You see that there? Four simple words, and to do it. Not just know it, but to do it, knowing it's a great thing, but it doesn't do us any good if we don't do it. I told this to my uh, Bible class when we were talking about this very subject. I said, look, everybody knows they're supposed to brush their teeth at least once a day. And you can have a toothbrush and toothpaste right there on your sink, and you can walk into your bathroom every day and say, okay, here's the toothpaste, here's the toothbrush, I know I'm supposed to do this, it'll help my teeth, set it back down and walk out. Do you know the right thing? Absolutely. You know exactly what you're supposed to do. Did you do it? No. So what's going to happen to our teeth? They're going to rot out of our head, right? We're going to have bad problems. So we can know exactly what we need to do, but if we don't do it, it's not going to really help us much at all. So we have to know it and do it. And Ezra prepared his heart to do the word of the Lord. You say, what in the world does that mean? That means this. God, before you even tell me what this means, I'm committing to do it. How about when you go to a, a seminar or a magic show or something weird like that, and the guy says, I need a volunteer. Most of us are hesitant to volunteer because we have no idea what we're getting. I go to kids camp every year with these kids, and they do some weird things to the leaders up on that platform. And every year, we're usually the orange team, They'll look over in our section and they'll say, okay, we need a leader from the orange team. And a man, I hide. I try to crawl down behind all the other yahoos who are waving and, and our kids are so gracious, they're all pointing at me and I'm like knocking them down and telling them to get out, wake them up in their sleep and do something to them and put you know, toothpaste in their hair or something. But anyway, um, I don't want to volunteer because man, they do weird things to the volunteers when I get up there. Nobody wants to volunteer. But, this one time, I kind of could tell what was going on, and I could kind of see that there was going to be a good prize. And he said, I need a volunteer. Man, I was jumping up and down. Of course, they didn't pick me. And the winner got like a candy bar or something good. Uh, but I only want to volunteer when I know it's going to be something in my favor, when I know it's going to be something I want to do, when it's going to be good. If I think there's a chance I might be embarrassed or I might get an egg cracked on my head or something like that, man, I'm not volunteering. What God is looking for is someone who has prepared their heart to say, okay, Lord, I will do what you want me to do, whatever it is. Now help me to understand it. First of all, he knows our heart, whether or not we're serious or not. And second of all, he's looking for hearts who have prepared themselves to say, Lord, I will do it. You let me know what you want me to do, and I will do it. The doing before the knowing. The willingness to do before we even know. That's the kind of heart God's looking for. I've talked to folks recently, and they, they you know, people, because I'm a pastor, I think people think I have a magic ball or something, and they come up to me and they say, you know, pastor, I just need help with this. What do you think I should do? And every time somebody says, what do you think I should do? I always whisper a prayer, God, give me wisdom. And so I said to this person, you know, I really just think from what I've heard you say is that you need to give God a complete blank check of your life. And you just, you just need to say, okay, God, I'm done being in control because I've made a mess of it. God, you do whatever you want. Even if that means I'm a missionary in Africa, God, I will do it. You know the person, as soon as they say, nope, forget that, I ain't doing that. I mean, I love God, but I ain't doing that. And they were dead serious. I gave them what I thought was sound advice. It's up to them. By the way, it's nobody in here, so stop looking at each other. But <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> But really, if we'll say, God, I'll do anything except for, then we haven't prepared our hearts to do what God has asked us to do. 
He's looking for somebody that says, no matter what that means, I'll do it. So Ezra did three things. Number one, he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. Number two, he prepared his heart to do the law of the Lord. And then number three, he prepared to teach the law of the Lord, to give it to someone else. You don't have to be a qualified teacher to impart God's word to someone. You can do it by example. You can simply show somebody how to be a Christian by the way they watch your life how you treat people, how you treat the word of God, how you treat his house, how you treat his things. They can watch you in an example. That you can be a teacher in that way. But yes, God does need skilled teachers. And Ezra was one of those people that God gifted. He was a ready scribe, a skillful scribe. And he said, you know what, God? I'm going to take what you have given me and I am going to put it into practice. I'm not only going to know your word, I promise you I will do it and then I'll tell others what it means as well. Here was a guy who had a specific set of skills that God gave him, and he, he said, God, I will use them to your glory. Now, you and I may not be, have the same gifts that Ezra did, but we all have something. We all have a place to serve. Plenty of opportunities to serve the Lord at Central and, and beyond. We all have a place we can serve. The question of the matter is, have I prepared my heart to know God's word, to do God's word, and to pass it on? Have I given my heart to serve God, to do it, to put my heart into my service to God? Whatever it is he calls us to do. Because all of us have a calling. This week, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart about this when I was reading this about uh, Ezra. And this thought came to me. I should be warned... Beware not to take myself too seriously, but to take my calling very seriously. And Ezra took his calling very seriously. And uh, like I said, taking myself too seriously can be a pitfall. But I ought to take God's calling on my life, his will, his ministry, his gifting. I ought to take that very seriously and prepare my heart to use it for his glory. Let's bow our head and close our eyes tonight. As we consider the word of God tonight, the example of Ezra, whom God had his hand upon him. God put his hand upon this man, gifted him in a special way to carry out a specific task for, him, for his glory. And the same can be said of each one of God's people. He has given you a gift. And he has given you an opportunity, a life, a place, a people, a community to serve with that gift. Have we prepared ourselves, prepared our hearts to give God full power in our life? to give him carte blanche to do whatever he wants? Have we prepared our heart to know his word, to do his word, and to pass it on? Am I putting all of my heart into my service for the Lord? Just a couple of weeks till we turn the calendar over to a new year. Even before we get to that number of 2018, we can decide right here and right now, Lord, tonight I want to just commit, recommit myself or commit myself for the first time to preparing my heart to serve you. Put my heart into it. Father, we thank you for the example in your word tonight. Lord, we realize that Ezra is just a person like all of us in this room tonight. Just a human being, just like us. Had the same struggles that we have. Lived in the same flesh that we live. Has the same limitations that we have. And had a gift. And while his gift may be different than mine, Lord, you have gifted us. And I pray that we would take our calling very seriously. That we would put our heart 
into our service and our calling for your glory. That you give us a heart for your word, to know it, to do it, to pass it on. God, I pray that this church, um, as blessed as it is, Lord, and you have been so good to us with the people and the, the ministry that goes on here, Lord, it is, it is mind-blowing. All the different people, all the different things that happen. That you would help us not to be weary in well-doing, that we would not get burned out, that we would not treat our calling and our ministry as just another task to check off, but Lord, as a very important work for you. And Lord, that we would serve you with all of our hearts until you come again. For the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray.